from the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 11, streaming now. Good evening, I'm Nicole Griffin. COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations continue to rise here in central Indiana. Studies show one group of Hoosiers are at a higher risk for more severe illness. Our Nikki Dementri speaks with an IU infectious disease expert on why everyone needs to do their part. Nearly 3% of American adults are immunocompromised, according to the CDC. And one local expert here in Indianapolis is hoping that Hoosiers get vaccinated and continue good health practices in order to keep their neighbors safe. Simply put, immunosuppressed conditions are those weakening immune systems. And when it comes to vaccines, Dr. Cole Beeler with IU Health says it's important for those immunocompromised Hoosiers to speak with their doctor. But he recommends they do get the vaccine. The CDC says those living with conditions like COPD, diabetes, and cancer are at an increased risk for severe illness when it comes to COVID-19. As for those taking immunosuppressant medications, say for lupus, psoriasis, or anything of that nature, Dr. Beeler says it's important to have have conversations with your doctor on finding a specific time to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Nothing's going to be perfect and e even with that timing I suspect that people who have immunosuppressing conditions are probably at risk for not developing as profound an immune response which is why it's extremely important for those uh, patients not only to get vaccinated but also to make sure that they've got an extra layer of protection after vaccination. The vaccine does not take you back to normal if you're one of those patients. You need to make sure that you're doing everything you can to try and to continue to avoid the, the virus that's in high circulation right now. In a late July CDC advisory group meeting, data was discussed behind considerations for a booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine for those living with an immunocompromising disease. Some 44% of U.S. breakthrough cases are thought to be with immunocompromised people. The advisory group also noted that studies show a reduced response in this group of people to the vaccine. The thing that really hurts for me is seeing a patient who tried to get vaccinated, uh, they had immunosuppressed condition, and they're around someone, unfortunately, that transmitted it to them silently, and then they have a bad outcome from it by, by no intention of their own. So yes, immunosuppressed patients can take that extra measure of precautions, but at a certain point in time, we need the community to really surround these people and try and take care of them. Dr. Beeler also wants to remind those that are living with an immunocompromising disease to continue those good health measures, even if they're vaccinated. That means social distancing, hand washing, and wearing a mask. In Indianapolis, Nikki Dementri, WRTV. And this week, Dr. Anthony Fauci says it is a priority to get a third booster shot sooner rather than later for Americans with a weakened immune system. Beginning tomorrow, Community Health Network will allow two visitors per patient over the age of 18, depending on the type of care and location. Community says the change is to protect patients and stop the spread of the Delta variant of COVID-19. Masks will continue to be required for all patients, visitors, and staff. This reminder for members of the Butler University community, starting tomorrow, all students, faculty, and staff are required to wear a mask indoors when in the presence of others. The school says it will evaluate the new policy on a weekly basis. Butler is not alone in this shift in policy. We have a list of mask policies in effect for several Indiana colleges and universities. Just look in the coronavirus section at WRTV.com. The U.S. is now back to where it was six months ago in terms of new daily COVID infections. And it's mostly because of the highly contagious Delta variant. The U.S. is now averaging nearly 100,000 new daily cases, the highest since February. Some of the nation's top health officials frustrated calling this latest surge preventable. I'm afraid we should not really have ever gotten in the place we are. Most of the cases, of course, now in unvaccinated people, almost all of the deaths are unvaccinated people. And these are younger people now, including children. Florida now has the highest number of confirmed pediatric COVID patients in the country. That state now accounts for 20% of all cases in the U.S. Meanwhile, Emory University is conducting a clinical trial to determine the effectiveness of mixing and matching different COVID-19 vaccines as booster shots. Right now, no booster shots are recommended. His entire career seemed destined to lead to a night like tonight. Peyton Manning earning his enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. 
from college All-American to a Super Bowl champ with the Colts and Broncos. Tonight saw more of the Peyton so many have come to love. Take the stage. Brad Brown has a look. It all started with a solid dose of Peyton's signature dry humor. I want to give a special thanks to my old rival Ray Lewis for being here tonight. Ray just finished giving his speech that he started in 2018. And ended with a heartfelt tribute to the game he loves. The future of this game is ours to shape. We just need to take tomorrow on our shoulders as readily as we donned our pads before each game. Let this moment become a cherished memory. And then remember, a legacy is only worthwhile when there is a future to fuel. In between, Peyton Manning held the crowd in his hands in full command of the show, much like so many games in his Hall of Fame career. We have inherited the history of this sport, even helped create it, but our responsibility cannot stop there. If we simply relive history and don't ignite the future of the sport, then we're not doing football justice. Each of us has deep roots in this game. Football even helped us carve out a place to belong. The Manning family played a huge role in the night. Archie Manning presenting his son for induction. Brothers Cooper and Eli were on hand as well. It was great. It was great. Happy for Peyton. It's a special day. Even nephew Arch Manning, the latest phenom quarterback to carry the name, already signing autographs for an excited crowd. A long line of former teammates from Indy and Denver made the trip to Canton. Just such a normal guy, really. It, when, you come, when it comes down to it, he just wants to work hard. He wants to be successful. Uh, he loves his friends. He's, he's supportive. Um, you know, he's, he's just a great guy. I can't say enough about him. And I was just honored to be a part of this whole experience. Frank, how's it feel to finally be here? Oh, this is special. I mean, celebrating this with Peyton, this is a special moment for all of us from Colts Nation. He was the... The Joker guy, I mean, he, he just he just had a great time in the locker room all the time. And the fun thing about him is he just made everybody better. He'd walk in the locker room and he'd ask a guy, hey, what do you do on this play? And then the next sentence was a funny joke that we're all laughing about. So he always made it, he always made everybody better. He changed the game. He changed the game how quarterbacks play. And, uh, you know, he's a better ambassador of the game and a better friend and a better teammate than he was a player. And he was a great player. To Jim Arce and the Indianapolis Colts organization, my gratitude is off the charts. You drafted me in 1998, and it was a joy and a privilege to represent the horseshoe. So who might be next for the Colts here in Canton? Maybe the likes of Reggie Wayne, Dwight Freeney. We know Adam Vinatieri will be here one day as well. As for Peyton, he'll be back in Indianapolis to receive his commemorative Hall of Fame ring for week two of the regular season coming up on September 19th. At the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, Brad Brown, WRTV Sports. All right, Brad, thank you so much. We appreciate that coverage. So good to see Peyton get honored. I've always been a huge Peyton fan, for always sure. Always a fan of number 18, for sure. Yes. Yeah, and it's been a hot weekend out there this weekend. A little steamy, and now it's going to get a little stormy out there, Nicole. We've had a couple of showers that have popped up here across central Indiana. You also notice this line back in Illinois. We'll talk about that in a second. Here's where we've got a couple of these showers, one that's moving through Hendricks County between Danville and the Avon area, about to cross 36 there, and then also around Martin into the Mooresville area in Morgan County. A few downpours. That's all pretty light stuff, though, that moves through pretty quickly. This line continuing to kind of fall apart. A few showers, though, around Williamsport and a couple rumbles of thunder just west of Sullivan. Not expecting any strong storms here as we go into the overnight. In fact, as we put Truecast into motion, you see those showers back to our west continuing to kind of fall apart a little bit. So we may not see much rain in Indianapolis. Another cluster of thunderstorms will come together by tomorrow morning. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Right now, our temperatures still on the warm side. 79 downtown, 80 in Muncie, and 75 in Columbus. Tomorrow morning, we will start in the lower 70s with scattered thunderstorms. We'll talk about the potential for some strong thunderstorms in just a few minutes. All right, Kyle, thank you. New at 11, Metro Police are investigating a shooting with two victims on the city's west side. One of the victims is a child who investigators say was grazed by a bullet. Another person suffered a gunshot wound. This happened late Sunday afternoon in the 2600 block of Harding Street. At last check, both victims were in stable condition. As for a motive or suspects, we are still waiting for that information. 
A jury will reconvene tomorrow to consider whether a northern Indiana woman who was found guilty of murdering her stepdaughter should receive life in prison without parole. On Friday, Amanda Carmack of Gas City was found guilty by a Grant County jury for the death of her 10-year-old stepdaughter. According to court documents, Carmack admitted to choking the girl. She claimed mental disease as her defense, but an evaluation found her competent to stand trial. A crackdown on carjackings is the goal behind a new partnership between Metro Police and the FBI. This year, there has been a 52% increase in carjackings compared to 2020. IMPD Criminal Investigations has created a carjacking task force. It will include IMPD robbery detectives, FBI violent crimes task force officers, and special agents with the FBI. So far this year, 52% of all suspects arrested were juveniles, 36% of them were under 16 years old. You may have seen this post right here on Facebook, a public awareness notice from Crane Naval Base in Southern Indiana. Officials don't want people to be alarmed because routine training begins tomorrow. And that means increased air traffic and extra noise. Officials say they will try to keep the noise level under control, but they say soldiers will be using training ammunition and other training devices to make the exercises as real as possible. Training is scheduled from August 9th to the 21st. It's been a roller coaster week for renters impacted by the pandemic. First, the ban on evictions expired, then it was extended again, but there are certain conditions that weren't in place before. Up next, a program that aims to help people avoid losing their homes. For Hoosiers who are still struggling to catch up on their rent because of the pandemic, the CDC last week issued a new 60-day eviction moratorium. This comes after a previous moratorium expired just over a week ago. WRTV investigates Stephanie Wade has been covering the eviction crisis for us since the onset of the pandemic, and now she has an exclusive look into a new program. The city of Indianapolis has come up with the help to hopefully help people avoid eviction. Right on this busy day at the Lawrence Township Small Claims Court, people are pouring in for their eviction hearing. The pandemic cutting many people's pay or hours of work, making them unable to keep up on rent. I'm struggling to try to keep my head above water. Like it's hard for people out here, right? Pandemic has hit everyone hard. To combat this, the city has come up with a brand new initiative first of its kind in the state, calling it the Tenant Advocacy Project. So the new folks are both waiting to see lawyers, correct? For the first time ever, if renters arrive to eviction proceedings without representation, they are offered free legal counsel through Indiana Legal Services and the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic to help them with their case. You're gonna give me free legal, right? Oh, yes, 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 thank you. One by one, <laughs> tenants took them up on their offer. Here's what we expected and hoped. Attorneys reviewing their case, providing legal advice, and seeing who might qualify for this new CDC moratorium. Plus, Good morning. making sure people are aware of rental assistance and actually helping them apply for the indie rent program right there on the spot. So let's go through it together. It's a lot of resources that I didn't even know about. I mean, this is the last dish. This is eviction court. Stacia Swanigan says her hours were reduced during the pandemic. She struggled to pay rent. The bills, oh my gosh, it's like my light bill tripled. Oh, uh, my gas and water bill because the kids are at home now. And coming to fight to keep she and her three kids in their home without legal representation was terrifying. We don't know what we have as like our rights. We don't know what we can do, what we can't do. According to Judge Kimberly Bacon, only about 3% of tenants bring attorneys when they come to court, whereas 81% of landlords bring representation. If people can't pay their rent, advocates say they likely can't pay for legal fees either, which can add up to hundreds and even thousands of dollars. The pro bono attorneys volunteering their time. If we can't make sure that people stay stably housed, then we also can't make sure that they're safe, their kids are safe, 
and that they're healthy. Uh, and so I just felt like it was something I could do. It's, it's not everything, but it's something. And I am one, but I am one, and I can be here, and I can help. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to keep my head above water and continue with my day with my head held high for my children. Working for you, Stephanie Wade, WRTV. Stephanie, thank you. And this is only a pilot program for one year, but they are working to place attorneys in all nine Marion County small claims courts. Mayor Hogsett says the goal is just to give people unfamiliar with the legal process facing the system alone a fair shake. Volunteers from Central Indiana are on the West Coast tonight helping those impacted by wildfires. At last check, according to the National Interagency Fire Center, there are currently 97 wildfires across 13 western states. The American Red Cross is providing relief through shelters, evacuation centers, and meals. The Indiana region of the Red Cross has two teams of volunteers deployed. We spoke to one man who just returned from Oregon. So what's different about the people who live in these uh, affected areas? They've lived there for decades and, and fires tend to be very non-discriminative and, you know, they can wipe out a home and burn it, you know, total, total ashes and there's very few belongings left. And so, you know, it has a very dramatic impact on those who are affected by the fire and it's very difficult for them. The volunteer says about 416,000 acres have burned in the bootleg fire, which translates into about 460 square miles, which he says is larger than many Indiana counties. The Red Cross has even more volunteers in the pipeline ready to, to be deployed, but the need for volunteers continues to grow. If you are interested in becoming a disaster action team member, just visit redcross.org slash DAT. How that video is tough to see. Yeah, and you know, Nicole, again today we had some of that haze and smoke from the western wildfires in our sky here across central Indiana. And I think we're going to see that off and on through much of the rest of the summer until they get those fires under control out west. Tonight we've got a couple of areas of rain. Let's take you into Hendricks and Morgan counties here. And this is lifting to the north. So going to be seeing a little more rain for you around the Mooresville area. Also Brownsburg, you'll get in on a shower and eventually a little bit of rain for you in the Danville area. And then we've got a few more scattered showers here in the western portion of the state from Williamsport just to the west of Petersburg. See even one lightning strike there. But again, we're not expecting any strong or severe storms overnight tonight. A lot of that rain will start to fall apart. And as it does so, those rain chances will be dropping to about 20% through the overnight hours. But then look at that as we get into tomorrow morning. Rain chances start to go up and fairly quickly. Right now, our temperatures generally coming in to the 70s, still holding on to 80 degrees, though, in Muncie. It's 79 downtown, 73 Greenfield, and Tipton coming in at 76 degrees. Tomorrow morning, 72 in Indy, 72 as well in Muncie. And look at that. Yeah, we've got that chance for some scattered showers, a few rumbles of thunder even as we start off the day. Here's Truecast, 9 a.m. You can see the best chance for that wet weather is going to be across the southwestern portion of the state. That complex is expected to stay mainly near and south of I-70. Some lighter rain showers around the metro area and then mainly dry as we go through the afternoon. Then we'll be watching this complex of thunderstorms overnight tomorrow night. This is 1230 tomorrow night coming in from the north and sweeping south and east. I think that is our best chance at seeing some of the stronger storms and we do have a marginal risk across much of central Indiana primarily for some gusty winds and possibly an isolated tornado there as well. Of course, we'll keep you updated throughout the day tomorrow. Scattered showers and thunderstorms off and on, not an all day rain for us. Temperatures will be a little bit cooler as we'll make it into the lower 80s, about 82 in Bloomington, 84 Indy and 82 in the Muncie area. And those temperatures are going to kind of stay in check here as long as we've got rain. But the rain chances come down just a little bit on Tuesday. We got a high of 90 for you there. 88 on Wednesday. We'll continue with a daily chance of showers and storms and through Friday. Most areas, though, only going to see about an inch or less of wet weather and then we'll dry it out for next weekend. When we come back, we will wrap up the final day of the Tokyo Olympics. 
After being delayed for a year by the coronavirus pandemic, the 2020 Tokyo Olympics have now come to an end. With no spectators in the stands, these games looked very different. Athletes were required to return home within 48 hours of competing, but those who were still in Tokyo all paraded in together rather than country by country. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi with the details. Fireworks lighting up the evening sky as the Olympic flame is extinguished. The 2020 Tokyo Games officially coming to an end. I declare the Games of the 32nd Olympiad closed. Delayed for a year by the coronavirus pandemic, some thought these games might not happen. The ban on spectators meant these Olympics looked and felt nothing like those of the past. The theme of the closing ceremony was, quote, worlds we share. It began with a video looking back at the games, acknowledging the challenges posed by the coronavirus. The focus was not the records or scores, but the valiant efforts of all the competitors. Stunt bikes and intricate light shows all part of the celebration. Rather than marching in country by country, in a show of unity, all the athletes paraded in together, though many had already departed Tokyo, required to leave. 48 hours after competing. Javelin thrower Kara Winger, a four-time Olympian, carried the flag for the United States. In the final day of competition, the U.S. women's basketball team defeated Japan 90-75 to for their seventh consecutive gold medal. The women also bringing home the United States' first ever medal in volleyball after defeating Brazil. The U.S. finishing the games with 39 gold medals, edging out China for the top spot. Team USA bringing home a total of 113 medals. Tokyo has now passed the torch to Paris, set to host the next summer games in 2024. The Winter Olympics in Beijing, now just six months away. Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. IMPD's wellness unit has several members to help officers during difficult times, including one with four paws. Allie, an English lab, came to IMPD in March of 2020. Her handler describes her as very social and laid back. So far, she has interacted with officers more than 50 different times, including when IMPD officer Brianne Leith was killed in April of 2020. Allie also works with other public safety agencies across the city. Her handler, IMPD patrolman Robert Turner, says he enjoys helping others whenever Allie is needed. Apple is testing a new system that searches iPhone and iCloud photos for illegal images. The company's software will try to match photos from Apple devices to those on a database from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. If enough photos are flagged, an Apple review team will disable the user's account and alert authorities. Privacy advocates have called the system, quote, an infrastructure for surveillance and censorship. Apple says its system does not scan personal photos. Yelp has a new feature that lets businesses list whether they require proof of COVID vaccination from customers and whether all workers are fully vaccinated. Yelp users can then use that information to filter their searches for businesses. Yelp says it will monitor the pages of businesses that decide to use the feature and they will be checking for any backlash those businesses get for their vaccination policies. Disney is unveiling the animatronic version of President Biden. It debuted this week at the Hall of Presidents attraction in Orlando. For the past few months, creative teams at Disney have been working to add Biden to the stage as the 46th president of the United States. Biden himself recorded audio of his presidential oath of office, which is used in the attraction. The Hall of the Hall of Presidents has been featured at the Magic Kingdom Park since opening day in 1971. Have you ever seen that, Kyle? I have, and you know, they are getting ready to celebrate their 50th anniversary here in wow. October. All right, let's check out satellite and radar right now. Again, we'll have a few showers mainly over the western portion of the state forest, but a daily chance of rain this week. All right, Kyle, thank you, and thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night.